you got to be super duper confident because every day in practice, you're going against a pro, you're going against somebody who thinks they're the best ever to touch a basketball. So I think that that definitely made me made me better, made me a lot. But, you know, it's it's I mean, I can't really I didn't really know no much else. We just it was just so much competition, especially my second year. We had 10, 10 players playing the NBA the next year. Welcome back to the Role Player Podcast, presented by Swish Cultures, available on all Swish platforms. So if you're watching this, go ahead, hit that like button or follow button for us right down below. Also available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. I am Jordan Taylor, joined by my guy, the CEO slash co-founder of Swish Cultures, 11-year vet. And Stanford gentleman, the one and only Anthony Goods, man. He's all ready to go, making a little move to Madrid today. Got his his hair is fresh. I'm back. I never left. You know what I'm saying? Looking a little smooth. Got that African cut. Boy, they did me like a little mohawk. I was like, I ain't like it at first. I was like, oh, that's all right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Looking smooth as all always. Like, for the most part. <laughs> it looked like you pushed some corners back. Or was that Father Tom? Yeah, you know, that's a little bit of both, man. That was a little bit of both. Buddy, cut, buddy started cutting my hair. He started cutting around the edges like this. I said, "Hold on, fam, what you doing?" Like I knew it was going. I thought it was going to be a disaster off rip. It turned out all right though. But yeah, no, that that's that's father time, man. But you know, we hanging on, we hanging on. But hey, man, we joined by a very very special guest, man. It's Houston, Texas finest. McDonald's All-American in 2013, a first-team parade All-American, Texas, Mr. Basketball, former NBA vet and now overseas pro playing with Ljubljana uh, Sedevita over here in uh, in Slovenia. We got the one and only Mr. Aaron Harrison, man. Appreciate you joining us. Man, what's up, man? Uh, appreciate y'all having me, fellas. What's going on? No doubt. No doubt, man. No, man, you wearing that Texas hat proudly. I know y'all, y'all sweat and beat yeah, up on the game. Run. Man. Yeah, we on a little run right now, so you know. Yeah, they still cheating over there. Uh, I'm about Astros. to say they over there. They over there. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. By any means. By any means. <laughs> by any means. By any means. We might be about to sweep the Yankees. I think it's three zero, right? It's three yeah, it's just, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I don't even I don't even watch a baseball like that. I only I feel like it's the Astros and the Yankees every year. At least the Astros for sure every year lately. Yeah. That shit yeah, really they've been crazy. doing well. Yeah. They've been figuring yeah. it out. But anyway, man, we're gonna skip the baseball podcast. This is a basketball uh baseball mm-hmm. talk. This is a basketball podcast. So you won Mr. Basketball in 2013. Hey, what what's it like, yo? Did you and your brother have like a, a crazy ride? Was I like talking shit to each other? Like who gonna win Mr. Basketball? Like <laughs> Oh no, nah, hell no. Nah. Uh, <laughs> I was more like a scorer, my brother more of a point guard, so he didn't really care, you know. Like he yeah, just really yeah. got me to rock and it wasn't, you know, playing playing in high school you usually play by yourself. You don't really have like another person on your team that's as you know as talented or whatever. And it was just you know I was lucky to have a point guard that was the number one point guard in the country. Just give me the ball, do whatever. So mm-hmm. now nah, I wouldn't have robber, and he was he was helping me out really. Man, speaking of that, obviously, like you said, high school you don't most all of us we don't get to play with as many people who are as talented. Obviously, everybody knows you, University of Kentucky, Big Blue Nation, um, where you play with the most talent, maybe you play with all NBA talent in college, right? So we're going to start right there. Talk about some of the pros and cons of playing with multiple other NBA players in college. Like, cause obviously, you know, some people look at that and it's like, oh, well, it's easy to go to Kentucky and get drafted. Cause it's like everybody get drafted from Kentucky, yeah. which is probably yeah. somewhat true, but also it's like, you got to fit in amongst pros. So talk about the difficulties and, and the pros of that. Well, you just got to know. I mean, uh, you just got to know what you do. You got to be super duper confident because every day in practice, you're going against a pro, you're going against somebody who thinks they're the best ever to touch a basketball. So I think that that definitely made me made me better, made me a lot. But, you know, it's, it's I mean, I can't really I didn't really know no much else. We just it was just so much competition, especially my second year. We had 10, 10 players playing the NBA the next year of one team. So. Uh, it was just, you know, it was just so much fun, so much competition. Uh, and we and we really actually figured out how to play together. We really want to win. So, uh, you know, it was just, it's, it's, that's, that was a special experience that I'll, I'll, I'll never forget for sure. Was, you know, it's funny. I think, like, I think back to uh, 
only time I kind of experienced anything close was like when I come back and play against the UCLA guys in the summer back when they had Darren and Russ and Kevin Love yeah. and all them. And they had a bunch of NBA guys and, you know, you know, I was at Stanford, you know, just kind of a, you know, a score there and then coming down to UCLA and just seeing how each of those guys kind of like, you know, how they worked out, how they played ones and, and, and just different things like – you could just tell the environment was different when you have that many guys that are thinking NBA and they actually got that kind of talent and not even just the talent, the mentality and the competitive, the competitiveness. So I can only imagine like out of Kentucky, man, it's like, you know, as good as anybody is coming in there, it's like once you start seeing other people that are just as talented, maybe a little bit older and whatnot, I'm sure it definitely makes you uh, like raise your game to a whole nother level, like day in and day out. Yeah, for sure. We was definitely uh, we was definitely uh, talking shit all pra- every practice. We'll go play ones at night. Uh, just just the the inner like the it's just so much you you can't really take a day off. You know, if you took a day off, you're not playing that day, or you look bad that day, and uh, it definitely prepares you for the next level. And and uh, you you really appreciate uh, getting pushed like that um, at at such an early age because most guys, you know, co- I mean. Obviously, it's a lot of talent on college team, but it's not ten NBA players on college teams, and uh, so it's just it's something that that's a great experience that I could that I could. I mean, I I feel like I learned so much, and I could actually when it's time, I feel like I could teach so much just from that. Shit, it ain't ten NBA players on NBA teams sometimes. Yeah. That's the- <laughs> nah, definitely not. Definitely not. Hey, but but listen, man. Just so for for those that know you, your so, your sophomore year, especially you played with uh, Carl Towns, uh, mm-hmm. Devin Booker, um, your brother, yourself. Uh, who am I missing? Uh, uh, Dakari Johnson, Tyler right? Uh, Dakari Johnson, uh, Alex Poitras, uh, Trey Lyles, um, Willie Cauley Stein. God damn. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, just just. To, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, we had, we had, we had ten for sure. We had we had we had five and five that, you know, Coach Cal tried to do the uh, platoon thing where five people in, five people out. Uh-huh. So yeah, we we definitely had ten that could go for sure. So just 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 for reference for those listening, but my question would be, as a scorer, I feel like like you said, your brother was a point guard. I feel like that's a point guard's dream as a point guard myself. Like when you could get a, yeah. you know, you pushing the break, you got yeah. Kari Johnson or Carl Towns running the floor, or whatever, yourself running the wing. But as a scorer, I feel like it's even more difficult because mm-hmm. how, how did you how did you find your rhythm amongst that many players? Was there anything that you did specifically to, you know, to stay confident? Was there ever a time where your confidence wavered? I mean, confidence. It, it, it was tough, especially that second year. It was very, very tough. But, you know, at that age, like, nothing can really weigh with your confidence. Like, I, you know, everybody – I I was going to be the next Michael Jordan in my mind. You know what I'm saying? The next Kobe Bryant in my mind, you know. So, it wasn't really confidence. It was definitely, like, I had to adjust not – okay, this – every possession not about me or every other possession not about me. You got to, you know, take what you can get and look the best and, and give them what they're looking for, really. So, that's really what I had to learn. Yeah, I thought that was dope. I actually remember one of the one of the dopest things. I was one of the first times I got to see you play in person was the was the Final Four against Wisconsin. I yeah. was injured and I was back, and I I think you didn't you didn't score in the first half, right? Yeah. And I I was amazed by I think you had like maybe eight or ten in the second half, but you was always like you stayed in the game defensively, and then to be able to hit a 40, 35 foot three for game was yeah. one of the most impressive things I've seen. Like as a scorer, I feel like you wasn't really getting your touches. So to me, that was really the true mark of a store a score, and it was it was impressive to be honest. Yeah, I mean that's one thing I, I've always been comfortable at the end of games. I mean, uh, it's just I, I don't know, it's just something that I, I've always had, uh, you know. But it, it was plenty of college games that I didn't get. I just felt uncomfortable, maybe, or I didn't get a touch, and and you know somebody else was playing super well, so I wasn't in in, in really the flow of the game. But I always felt at the end of um, at the end of the game, I just felt like I'm the person who's supposed to have the ball, no matter. I mean, no matter what, who who else is on the court, no matter else, what is going on. I think I, I've always been super confident at the end of the game. How do you how do you navigate? How did you navigate um, actually going to the NBA? So it's like you stayed for two years, right? And you could have left after your freshman year. 
Uh, so how, how did you navigate that decision making process? And what is there what, if anything, would you have done differently going back? Uh, definitely. <laughs> shit, probably just left, for real. Uh, yeah. You know, the more they get to see you, the more they, they pick at your game and say what you can't do and shit like that. So I think I mean, if I could do something different, I probably would have uh, maybe would have considered leaving more my first year. Um, but I definitely I, I wouldn't trade that second year for a world uh, for the world. I mean, we went 39 or no, I think 38 no, and just one of the best college teams ever. We didn't you know we didn't win a chip, but definitely being a part of one of the best college teams ever is a great experience, and you know can't trade that. What uh what went into the decision to come back? Uh, you know, just coach um, coach Cal, my dad, you know. Uh, and me and me and my brother, we just I think we just decided like, OK, we could we could come back and really put our stamp on it, be the best really players, guards in the country and just, you know, be comfortable in the draft instead of being worried about the draft or whatever. And it didn't it didn't go like that. But I, I mean, I still wouldn't go back and change nothing just because of the experiences and, and, and the stuff that I learned. So. Do you do you think uh, yourself being, like you said, McDonald's All-American? Do you think there – or do you see the value in someone like yourself going to an HBCU or a smaller school and just rocking out as opposed to going to, you know, the Blue Blood Kentucky and being amongst pros? Yeah. I mean, definitely I'll – it's times have changed. And uh, so I definitely might uh, – say if I have a son that could play at a high level, I definitely might – you know, give him advice that my dad couldn't give. My dad did the best, but he, you know, he wasn't, he didn't, he didn't really know. So maybe going somewhere that you could do whatever you want, be the man and show your talent um, is the way for some people. And some people who, you know, need to be around guys and need to be uh, kind of hidden to a certain extent, go, go where you need to. I think every, it's, every situation is different. It depends what position you play, who the coach is, where you comfortable at. So yeah, but HBCUs are definitely, something that uh, I would have definitely considered way more if I was coming out of school now than I did before. I think, like, especially when you were coming out, too, that was, like, right when I felt like the league was starting to give mid-majors and low-majors a little more respect, you know, because yeah. after, like, Steph and, you know, Dame Lillard yeah. and everybody started having success coming from, like, smaller schools. And I think, like, I mean, even – even when I was coming out years ago, like I was like, man, uh, coming out of high school, I was thinking about like, man, it would be dope if I could go to HBCU. But then I was thinking about yeah. visibility and I was just like, yeah, of course, I don't want to, you know what I mean? But, uh, but I think like now it's, it's definitely, I feel like the game has definitely changed and it, it's made it possible where you could go to a smaller school. And if you got enough game, like, you know, you can make it as opposed to yeah. back in the day, like, Big East, you know, Big 12, the bigger yeah. schools were the only ones that were on TV. Everybody else was an yeah. afterthought. Yeah, exactly. I mean, things changing with the internet and everybody got coverage now. So if you just, you know, you got to go do your thing, you you be dominant wherever you're playing. I feel like people will see you uh, just like you would tell like, like players like uh, Ja Morant, play, players like that going to smaller schools and and doing whatever they like doing doing their thing and, and doing what they're supposed to do it just you know it depends what path you know come, if luck comes with it all that comes with it but you just gotta you know you gotta do the right thing for you you know you, you never really know i honestly think the more skilled you are the better off you are going to a smaller school these days especially as a scorer like i feel like the more the more game you do have if you could just go up and put up crazy numbers and you crazy skilled and get to yeah. show everything you could do. I feel like that's, you know, nowadays maybe better off than going to a, a power five school where, you know, you get to, you know, you get your 11 shots and you get to average 14, 15, which is, I mean, and that's good. But it's like if you if you really skilled and, you know, you got size and you at a smaller school or whatever, averaging 22, 23, I feel like now mm -hmm. it's like, oh, shit, like you know, he's, the, he's the one. Like you might – that might have more clout than, than the power yeah. five school. I mean, it just really, I mean, it depends who you are, what they what they want, you know? Like, sometimes it'll work if you go to a big school and get 11, and sometimes if you go to a small school. It just depends on, like, you know, how people 
see your potential and all, all type of, you know. So it just depends on who you are, what position you play. And uh, what's really underrated, I think, is even, like, how, how you look. Like, I think scouts look at, like, oh, he looks like he could become, you know, uh, this type of player based on his body, based on how he moves. So I think that has a lot more to to go into it too. What was what was some of the feedback you got? You know, obviously going on the drafted and then working your way into Charlotte, like you mm-hmm. fit the mold, I feel like, of like mm-hmm. an NBA two guard. So yeah. what or NBA combo, I should say, but like so what was some of the feedback you got um, you know, going into it and then after the fact? But the funny thing is, I mean, I never really had no bad feedback. Like I had a couple teams said they would take me, you know, if I was there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't really have no feedback. Become a more consistent shooter. I mean, that comes with, you know, being mature and being in the gym more as a pro and stuff like that. But to be honest, I didn't I didn't really have no no negative feedback. I can't really remember uh a team or someone saying, Oh, this is what you need to do this, this is what you need to do that. Okay. Goods, what feedback you get, man? Man, I wasn't uh I wasn't a point guard. I wasn't passing the ball. I couldn't I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't pass the ball. They like he could shoot it, like the shooting drills, one on one stuff. I was good. <laughs> I could cook there, but you know what I mean, and that's one thing I think that like I started to pick it up a little bit like early in my career, but like especially like as I started to play in Europe a lot more, man, I got so much better with the pick and roll. Like back yeah. then I was very Basic reads, and then at six three, you know what I'm saying. It was, um, you know, I think that was kind of that was kind of my crutch was just not being able to be like a point guard, a reliable combo guard that could really just run the point and you'd be okay for 15 minutes. You know, mm-hmm. that makes sense. What about uh, what y'all think of uh, of nil and how that would change? Obviously, people get money and all that, and it's great. But I want to know more so, like, because, shit, you, you was getting at Kentucky. You getting Stanford. I don't know. I don't know if we fuck with Stanford like that. So you was probably getting shit, 50, 50, we, 50 we, we getting that Yahoo, like Google that. money, man. Yeah. We didn't be getting all, yeah. I'd have been, I'd have been, I'd have been, a, I'd have been a co-owner of Instagram by now. Yeah, you would have been an engineer. Then you wouldn't be playing no basketball. But, <laughs> but nah, at Kentucky, you get, you get, you getting a million, 500, a million, I would imagine, mm-hmm. at Kentucky. Easy. So, how would that change your decision making process in entering the draft and choices to go overseas potentially as well? Oh well, I mean, as of now, I probably wouldn't. Have, I mean, I probably wouldn't advise somebody to even go to school right now. Like, if you if you just if you know, like some people know, like if you got it, you got it. Like, um, go to the ignite or whatever it's called in the G League, or go make some money because. School is for certain players and certain players is not, to be honest. I think uh, if you know that you're going to be a pro and that that's like, it's just, you know, there's no need to go to school and just get nitpicked and people just, oh, he can't do this. He can't do that. Especially now, like there's other avenues to get to the NBA and get whatever, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, but for, I mean, but school, the experiences that I got from school, like I said before, is just unmatched. Like, so I can't say that I wouldn't go back to school, but with the NIL, that shit is just getting crazy. And I think if I had, if somebody gave me 500000 when I was 18, it probably wouldn't have been a good idea. Like, it wouldn't have been great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, how do you stay in the gym? How do you stay in the gym? I, I just think back, like, there were so many times in college where I couldn't do stuff because I didn't have money and I stayed home or, you know, I just went and kicked it with the homies and at the gym yeah. or whatever. Like if you got 500 and they give you two days off or whatever it is, like yeah. you're flying back home, you know what I mean? You're going to go yeah. kick it with the, with the boys from high school. Like, I don't know, man, I, it would have been a distraction, but I think it, it definitely, I mean, maybe not for Aaron going to Kentucky, but I think for uh, a lot of kids, it definitely affects on where you're going to school coming out of high school, you know, that whole NIL decision. And then uh, for some guys that may be borderline second round undrafted, I think, you know, you definitely have to look at, all right, maybe I should stay in school and get this guaranteed money as opposed to, you know, that risk. Yeah. Hold on. So you choosing right now, 
you choosing, both of y'all choosing Ken, or Ignite over going to Kentucky for a year? You And, and this hits home for you. Like, this way, you know, you know Aaron, this for you. You a McDonald's All-American. You choose it. Ignite over Kentucky? No. I'm not, <laughs> okay. I, I, can't, I can't do that. I, I'm not going to say that. But I'm saying if I had a kid right now, if I had a son or, you know what I'm saying, I'm trying to help him, I would say we got to check this, you know, the school thing is nice and all, but is this the best way to get what you want out of life? You know what I mean? No, nah, facts. Facts. But I think, yeah. I, I don't know. I might be an optimist. But I feel like people, you selling some of these kids short. Like, I feel like kids still have the bandwidth to understand. Like, if you give them 500000 but you looking at what Jordan Poole just signed for? 140 140 Yeah. Or even, like, okay, say a cat like my, Tyus Jones signed two for 30. Like, I feel like kids still have the bandwidth to be like, all right, this 500 is nice. I'm going to stay in this gym and <laughs> turn this 500 into 15 a year. Yeah, I mean, pro- I mean, at that age, I'm five hundred is everything, you know. Like, if That's I had five hundred thousand when I was eighteen, I mean, I would have thought I was just as rich as anybody else. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, five, I don't know. Five hundred now. Five hundred now. I'm gonna think. I, you know what I'm saying? Five. Yeah. Shoot, I'm good. <laughs> Give me five hundred thousand right now. We good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, like now we can, you know, I, I'm gonna turn it into something, and you know what no, I'm saying. But when I was a kid, it was just, I just, I just can't say uh, I would pick something over Kentucky just because of the experiences that I had. The, you know what I'm saying? Like that, that shit is unmatched, like unmatched. So, and you know, I don't know. But and it's relevant because these kids are doing like Scoot Henderson. Had, I mean, he's a Kentucky kid, exactly. right? Like so, exactly. and he's choosing Ignite. So I'm I'm trying to figure out like, is he really benefiting from choosing Ignite over Kentucky? Is it the play style, like being able to play that NBA style? Is that gonna is that really going to help his career uh, that much? Mm, I think so. I think the yeah. G League is much easier than college. Mm. Like the score, and, and for him to adjust to the G League is 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 easier than adjusting to college. You never know; your coach could be correct, or the coach don't like you, or you could be. You know what I'm saying? Like you get, but if you in the G, you 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 just you playing. You know, you they want you to be something, so you you gonna be it really. If it, that's, I think that's how the league really work. If they want you to be that, and if you got if you work hard, you I mean they gonna give you the opportunity to be that if you if you can. You know, in Kentucky, you could have you could go there and maybe it, you know maybe they don't like you as much because you know what I'm saying. So that's what I yeah. think. But I think in the G League too, you kind of get a better look for you know somewhat of what the speed of an NBA game will be like. So I think you are preparing yourself in that way. You're dealing with you know a faster paced game. You know with the with the NBA rules. You know you probably got a lot more uh, length than you would like in college playing and then also the playing style like you know you fuck around play against a slow ass school like Wisconsin like what is that really doing for you you know what I mean so I think that you know um, playing in the Ignite I think definitely offers somebody like Scoot like if you're ready but that's the thing is like everybody's not ready you know what I'm saying it's like Scoot Scoot was ready he was ready a couple years ago but if, if you ain't got that level of athleticism toughness and talent like it's going to be a bad look for you, and you do need to go to a Wisconsin and kind of hide. <laughs> hey, look, let me tell you something, man. <laughs> let me tell you something. What was y'all record, Eric? You said it was 38-0? Ah, uh, yeah, it was. It was th- that was y'all record? Mm-hmm. What was, your, what was the real record at the end of the year? Uh, 38-1, I think. And who y'all lose to? Uh, some slow-ass team, I don't know. <laughs> You see, you, you see how the internet do. <laughs> oh, there we go, there we go. Who y'all, who y'all lose to? Oh, we lost to some slow ass team. Slow <laughs> ass team. always want to hate till they catch an L. <laughs> hey, and goods. We all we gotta do is wait another couple weeks, and y'all gonna be in the same boat. Of course, y'all. Oh, we do that. That game is no coming up November force. 11. It, but yeah, y'all. Hey, but like like I said, man, I, I can't I can't do it with Aaron. But you know what I'm saying? Who had the most pros since 2000, man? So you <laughs> yeah, know what I mean? I can't I can't, the, I, <laughs> we, we I can't do it with Kentucky. We have an ongoing a running debate with. Uh, 
he thinks Stanford, everybody that come on, you talk about Stanford got the most pros, but he real quiet when you get on here. Oh, we do? Yeah. Stanford got the most pros? Hell since no. Two th- since 2000, everybody we've had on here, Stanford has had the most uh, NBA players. Uh, drafted. That's because we've been having Except cats Kentucky. from Rhode Island. Kentucky. We've been having we've been uh, having cats from Rhode Island and, and Lamar. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah, yeah obviously, man. Ain't no question. <laughs> hey, but look, Marquette. we get in Marquette effect. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but nah, yeah, ain't nobody hiding at Wisconsin either. I'm gonna let that slide. We're gonna touch on the international stuff, man, a little bit. You know, obviously as we all international international players are or former players, vets, whatever it may have you. So there's a lot of early cuts going on um, in in Europe right now. You know, there was some news that came out talking about Panda might part ways with Andrew Andrews. Obviously, in the NBA mm-hmm. side, the Lakers have struggles. Uh, you know, but the Lakers wait 20 games, whereas Europe is so quick to so quick to cut people. So, what do you think about the the environment in Europe as far as like the the team the team structure and the way their patience with players? And how long do you think it takes for a team to truly gel? Uh, well, it depends on what part of the world, but a lot of people, they, they base it on emotion a lot, like emotion. So the fans and the fans don't like it, then the, the you know, the front office don't like it, and they and they make decisions off emotion uh, a lot. Um, I don't – of course, how you going to cut somebody? It's been like four games over here, right? Three, four games. And they cut people off four games, three, four games. So, you know, that's based off emotion. Um, and you just got to know how to how to deal with emotion. And you got to be able to um, just adjust, really. Um, and just hopefully, hopefully you get a, a decent coach. And he, you know, he appreciate what you can do and, and, and give you a chance, really. But you just got to know that, that it's emotional over here. And people make decisions. They don't really, you know, they don't understand that this our life. We away from our people and everything, and they making decisions because people saying they are bad, you know, making emotional decisions. And so you just gotta, you gotta, you just gotta hope for the best, really, and just play, try to be productive in, in what they can do. Just like we was talking about in my last game, you know, I, I don't, you know, it just it just depends on how the coach is feeling emotionally that day. Man, <laughs> you ain't lying. Yeah, lying. How much? How much do y'all think that the fans affect front office decisions in the NBA and in and in uh, Europe? I mean, I don't think it's. I don't think in the NBA it affects. It affects much. You know, outside of like, let's say, like disciplinary, like disciplinary actions and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, I feel like the fans kind of. You know, you do have to save face in that regard, but. In regards to cutting a player or whatever that is, I don't think the fans have that much. Because I think, like, when you look at the NBA versus Europe, like, Europe, all these teams are funded through, like, sponsorships, you know what I'm saying, and relationships with the owner and things of that nature. So it's like when we're talking about fans in Europe, a lot of times it's it's these guys that are supplying your bread. So a GM or an owner could be getting money from, let's just say, the Coca-Cola of whatever country – and they see that you're losing or whatever, they want you to make changes, and then they just don't pay the team. And then the team gets paid late. Like they, It's not like they're giving them the bread all up front. They're giving you 30000 per quarter or 50000 per quarter or whatever it is. So it's like I think that's where the pressure kind of gets to people that have nothing to do with the team. Like they're just a sponsor, yeah. but then they're going to hold bread because the team and their investment is not going the way that they want. And then they try to you know inflict that power on the team and now – the coach and the GM are forced to, okay, let's just change some stuff around to keep, you know, the shareholders and everybody else happy, which I think is BS. But I think that's just a completely different um, – it's a completely different business model than the NBA, and I think that that's why the uh, the, the influence is different. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I don't have coaches that then read articles and – Got you know what I'm saying oh they're saying this about me because of you guys you know what I'm saying like I, I had coaches say you know stuff like that so I think the fans the fans affect it way more in Europe than than they do you know in the states obviously the NBA is too much money involved you can't fans say what they want but if somebody making thirty million dollars they're all not doing nothing like, they're not they gonna keep playing and they gonna lose or win they gonna keep playing no matter but over here 
the fans have a lot to a lot to do with everything. You know, fans start throwing stuff on the court, uh, booing. Every, they don't care. You know what I'm saying? So they emotional. Over, the fans are emotional as well. So. Yo, what was it? What was it like when you first came overseas? Like, what was like your, uh, what was like your welcome to Europe moment, or like just the craziest moment? You just like, yo, this is really different than than basketball in the states. Shit, uh, my first, uh, oh yeah, probably my first road trip. Really, um, we played Red Star, and uh, I was on uh, Galatasaray, and they they got a weird rivalry because uh, I think. Um, a couple years before that, a Red Star fan died at one of the Galatasaray games. Like, one of the fans killed him. Uh, so we went there. They had to, like, walk us off the bus with shields, like, one by one. They was throwing, like, n- coins at us as we walked on the court, throwing bottles at us. I couldn't hear it. Like, we couldn't hear. I couldn't hear somebody standing right in front of me. I was like, bro, we just got to get out of here. I don't care about this game. We got to get out of here safe. Like, I'm done. Let's go home. So yeah, that was probably that was the craziest game that I ever played in in my life by 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 far. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy as hell, man. Yo, so what? Um, what if you if you had a kid, like we you've, you've mentioned, if you had a kid, what would you do? With him, what you would do with him a couple times? Would yeah. you want your kid to be an overseas pro? Mm, what would I want? I mean, yeah. Uh, would I want him to be an overseas pro, as opposed to what? Like, you mean like nothing? Mean? Like, if if it was just like, is this a lifestyle that is like, is it a lifestyle that is um, what's the word I'm looking for? Is it a lifestyle that is uh, desirable for your mm. child? <sighs> yeah, I, I think I think yeah. he could. I mean. I, Overall, I would say I enjoy my experience overseas. I mean, I've had some obviously some tough days, some tough tough weeks, but uh, I definitely appreciate it. It make me it make me appreciate a lot more. Like in the states, it make me appreciate my family more, everything like relationships more. So yeah, but I think that I know enough to to how to how we can avoid that if he got the talent and you know if he got everything I, I think I know enough to, so we can afford that for sure. <laughs> Facts. I was asking that because I I don't know if I would like it, if my kid wasn't good enough to play in the NBA. There's a lot of pros to overseas. Like I mean, call, you learn cultures. I think you really I think you become more open minded. Like you said, appreciate the states too as well. Like there's just a lot to learn over here. But I don't know if it's something that I would like. If my kid was like, oh, I'm gonna go overseas, I'd be like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> how, how much you getting? Like eh, you got, no, 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 for sure. Right? Yeah, your threshold yeah. gotta be something crazy. <laughs> no, nah, you got to Yeah, yeah. I was saying like, oh, if he it just didn't work out, but he's good enough. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. But yeah. if you just maybe trying to make it in basketball, then no, hell no. <laughs> what about you, know. Goods? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it definitely uh, it depends on the situation. But I think, like, obviously, just looking at the world it is today, um, there's just so there's just so many more ways to make whatever bread you're making overseas, there's so many more ways to make that bread back home. So it's like, if just going overseas or whatever it is, is really what you want to do, then, then fine, do it. But I, I would say like, bro, there's a lot that you could do. I mean, you got cats like traveling around to, to parks and playing on ball is life. Like, you know what I mean? And they're making bread, like, you know what I'm saying? King of the court and all these little tournaments and stuff like that. Like, there's just, I mean, and again, this is just based off of what we know now, just with the internet and whatnot. I mean, you really, you really don't need to go over there to make bread. You could do it being here, be a dunker. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's cats out here making, making bread, just doing, just dumb shit. Dunking. So, yeah, Dunking. exactly. My arms yeah. too short for all that. What's missing from the overseas experience, like that would make it better. What y'all think? Mm-hmm. I mean, we overseas. Uh, so, I mean, I don't, I don't really know. Like, it's just being away. Like, you just, ho- you just gotta adjust to a whole different life. You gotta, people don't understand you. You don't understand them. Uh, I, I don't really. The money. It depends on what team you. Really, the money. If the money, 
if the money go up a little bit and they could be on time and it could be like a little more, you know, just a, I think that'll, that'll make it a lot better to be honest. Yeah. I think, I think money and then also, uh, well, money in regards to the amount being on time and things like that. But I think also like if we could just get rid of these teams in these small ass cities, like, you know, just move them out the way and like only big, only big cities, you know what yeah. I mean? And you just play on those teams and that's it. I think that will make it a lot more enjoyable too. Cause I think, yeah. <clears throat> I think some of your worst times or at least in my career was just when I was just in like a small ass city far away from anything. And you just going nuts. Like your mama don't even want to come visit you. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. Exactly. You know what I mean? That's yeah. when, Girl, that's when it gets tough. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like <laughs> I think I think it's I think it's synced up all star breaks, man. Every country gotta have the same all star break. Everybody need about everybody need a week off, man. We all going to Istanbul, man. That's what I need. We all going to Istanbul. We all going to London. It all That's synced thing, up. You know, one thing I ne I never really played in like uh, well I'm in Slovenia now, but this is probably the slowest place I played. But I played in all pretty pretty decent cities. I played in Istanbul and Athens, so. Uh, I mean, I, I really enjoyed a, like a lot of times off the court, but I, I mean, I, I got I got homies that played in you know fucking everywhere, like literally everywhere. <laughs> like I got friends that play in Mexico that make twenty five hundred a month, yeah. like yeah. just because they want to play basketball. See, if those you're saying going back to like my son, my son will never, I will never let my kid do that. No, <laughs> <laughs> you ain't got it. You ain't got it. Let's get a job. <laughs> Right. Take it, take it on down to H and R block, huh? Yeah, yo. Bro. <laughs> yo, I had a conversation with the homie the other day, and he was just like, "Yo, like, if they could remove like all the political, you know, the political stuff behind this decision, like now is like the perfect time for Champions League to go snatch up those those Russian teams, those big Russian teams." Like, if you think about it, it's the golden opportunity. Champions League added Cheska, Zenit, Unix. That changes BCL local, in a – Loco. It changes BCL in a completely different way, man. Like, but obviously, I mean, there's just so many political implications behind that decision. But, I mean, the opportunity is uh, is there, man. That's that's crazy. It looked like you're really about to expand to Dubai um, in a couple of years. That. So yeah. that's uh, you're about to look different in the next uh, next couple of years. I swear, miss all the good shit, man. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say, as soon as I finish, they about to have to buy and up the money and you know yeah. what I'm saying. They'll be traveling to the states and shit. It'd be flying exactly. charter. They're gonna do all this extra shit. Like, nah, man. <laughs> but you want to hit the culture question? Ed? Yeah, yeah, man. So. Recently, man, like Nike signed uh, the majority of the lottery picks to like shoe deals like Jay Niley, Jalen Duran, Chet Holmgren, et cetera, et cetera. But as we know, like there's a dis decreasing number of uh, signature shoes for like NBA players, you know, obviously outside mm -hmm. of like the, the superstars. Um, many more players are signing like product deals and things of that nature. So my question is, does it make sense for players to sign with, a smaller shoe deal and make more money. And then the second part of this question is what impact, if any, does being a Nike athlete have on your career? Uh, well, I'm going to go with the, the money, me personally. Um, I'm going to go with the money, but I understand like the Nike, you know, Nike is the biggest, the best, you know what I'm saying? You can't deny Nike. Uh, and, uh, I don't know. I, I think if I was in that if I was in that situation, I would definitely. If the money is a big difference, then I would have to go. But if the money is not a big difference, I think you should, you have to go to Nike. It's like fucking going with Sprite or Coke or you right. know what I'm saying. Like you know, everybody loved Nike. You loved Nike growing up. Like you know what I mean. So it just depends on the money for me. What's, what's the cool. what's the threshold? What do you mean? Like, what's the like, what's the money difference? The biggest money difference that you'll accept is like fifty thousand. You going with the money? Is it like ten thousand? You going with the money? Or are you oh, going no. with? You know what I'm saying? No, I got to be bigger than that. So like a hundred thousand. Yeah, a couple hundred thousand. Yeah. 
Okay, okay. okay. All right. All right. Let, let, let's let's put it like this. Let's say Nike's only offering you a product deal, right? So you just got a mm-hmm. product deal. You ain't getting no extra cash, um, mm-hmm. but you got an allotment throughout the year. Take care of your family yeah. and whatever you need. And then mm-hmm. Lee Ning comes and they like, yo, we're going to give you 80000 on top of product. <laughs> We're going to Nike. Yeah. <laughs> study wrong, study wrong. If, I'm the, if I'm in the NBA, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with Nike, unless like leaning, trying to give me a portion of the company or some shit, like some shit like that. But, <laughs> but yeah, eighty. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go with. It. I'm gonna go with Nike. Eighty thousand. That's a whole house now. Yeah. But... Where a whole house? Where? What you mean? That's a down payment. Oh damn, baby! I thought you said you said a whole house. Oh, oh no, I forgot you. You, big time. you, you buy you buying all your joints in cash, huh? Hey man, I wasn't I wasn't raised in Madison, Wisconsin, huh? <laughs> we ain't got the we ain't got those shotgun houses. We ain't got those shotgun houses out here. Hey, hey, neither was I, my man. I'm Minneapolis, born and bred. Don't be spreading that slander on here, man. <laughs> but, but nah, I probably I probably. I'll probably go with uh I probably go with Nike myself, man. You gotta go with the checks. And I'ma have everybody. I'm gonna have every, how much how much product you get? As much as you want? Eighty thousand? Yeah. Eighty thousand. Eighty thousand worth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm going I'm going with Nike. I can't I can't be out there like no poop up wearing no lead name. I don't care what them dudes yeah. be talking about. Like Yeah, I uh, see like yeah, like I'm sure like D Wade and shit, he getting millions, millions. from him, like, like something yeah. like that. But yeah. I'm not I'm not, I'm not just wearing that shit for fun. Yeah, no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I can't she gonna look like wearing a Lee Ning headband, Lee Ning yeah, like, sleeve. Like, nah, couldn't be uh, me. What you choosing? You choosing Lee Ning, huh? Uh, <laughs> man, I mean, it, obviously, it just depends on how much bread you're making. Like, obviously, if you're getting an NBA check, then yeah, I'll probably, you're not really stressing off of like 80K. But I think that, um, I don't know. It, I would be trying to kind of like Aaron said, I'd be trying to work out some growth like, you know, OK, like we got this check. But, you know, what is it looking like moving forward? You know what I'm saying? Like, how could I like double this money up? Like, is it appearances in China um, where I could, you know, make some other money and stuff like that? Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and just make that grow exponentially somehow, because I feel like if you if you're just a product athlete on Nike, like you're not touring, you're not going on the Kyrie tours and making the appearances and all that other stuff. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's really just product. And then you just going home looking fresh. So, um, but it would have to make sense business wise, but I, I would look at the leaning deal, but I, I don't think 80 K and then go home is enough though. I think it would have to yeah, be sure. something more. I ain't, I ain't gonna hold you though. Nike, Nike gonna have your confidence being all right. At least you gonna look, cause you gonna look good, good. all that. You know what I'm saying? You know, I'm a Nike good. athlete. You know what I'm saying? So that that might yeah. be the, that might be the impact it has on you. Yeah, but as far sure. as like other than the fact that just you know feeling good and saying you're a Nike athlete, yeah, it's it's too many of them now to really yeah, to yeah, yeah. have a true true impact. Like shoot, I might be a Nike athlete now. I don't even know it. everybody Nike athlete. Check yeah, my nah, shit. It's, uh, especially especially out in Europe, man. They just be tossing them sponsorships around, man. man. What? <laughs> Dude, Nike, J- what? Man, Nike Japan? Boys? <laughs> Nike Japan? What? Nike Japan and Nike France? France? Man. Oh, yeah. Nike, oh, yeah. Tell. Nike France. I do be seeing, like, a bunch of little dudes, like, Nike athlete in that. Yeah, bio. yeah, yeah. And they bio. They be, <laughs> they be having it in their bio. Bro play, bro, play for Rowan. Like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Nike you know what I'm saying? Athlete. That's the... Hey, go ahead, go ahead, get you. Go nice. ahead, if you single, go ahead, have you a kid out here in Europe, man. That's the best thing you could be these days, is an international black basketball player, set for life, I'm set for you. life. I'm telling you, <laughs> man. But uh, but moving forward, man, I seen a um, I seen an interesting uh, article. They were talking about how De'Aaron Fox said that playing at 200 pounds last year was too much, and now mm-hmm. he's back down to 185. He says he feels a lot better. And uh, just to put it all in context, he he uh, at the NBA uh, draft combine when he was coming into his rookie year, he was one sixty seven. So the uh, the question is is how much is playing weight a factor for guards, and when do you think that? And does that is that more of a factor like later in your career, which may or may not be obvious for some guys, but uh, how much is a is a uh, playing weight a factor for guards? 
Uh, well, me personally, I think um, I like to try to keep my weight down. Uh, I, I just I just know when I get to a certain weight, I'm like, I feel a little different. And but you know, it depends how you play. Really, it depends who you are. Like some people can you know play with more muscle, more bulk. They need to put more bulk on, but I think that is like over over like overrated in basketball where people oh he needs to put weight on he needs to put weight on De'Aaron Fox he probably one of the quickest if not the quickest player in the NBA why he need to put weight on he, like that's what makes him special that's just something that some strength coach that just been doing push ups or working with a football team his whole life just decided and you know or it looks better supposedly you know but it just depends who you are if you you know if you're the quickest person in the league. He probably jumped one of the highest. You don't. I don't think you need like. I don't think you need to worry about putting twenty pounds on. I think that's no, your body not used to that. That's not. That's not what you for. I I agree hundred percent, man. I think your body when you play with less weight, especially as a guard, I feel yeah. like you just feel better. Like you feel you move better, you bouncier, you springier, your quick twitch seems like it's better. Um. And especially now to your point, like, yeah, De'Aaron Fox putting that weight on, the benefit of it is maybe you withstand some contact. But the way the game is played now, like, if yeah, you can don't. take the contact and it looks like a foul, like, you almost that's, better off. You know what I'm saying? That's why like, we got fouls, blood. bro. That's why we <laughs> got fouls. You don't need muscle. That's why we got that's referees right, bro, the out way here. The, game, the, the way the game is played now, like, you see, I mean, Bron gets fouled every play if we being real. Like, and the way that he takes the contact – it never looks like a foul, but it's like if you, you know, Trey Young or whoever it is, the way he be bouncing off dudes, it's like he would really be getting hit the same way. But he's so little and light, it's like, oh, yeah. shit, you definitely got to call that. So it's almost an advantage from a from a refereeing standpoint um, to to have less weight. Yeah, I think it's a it, I think it's an old school mentality, man. Like exactly, you know, because you see, I mean, you saw. Jordan was lifting before games and you seen Kobe put on the muscle and stuff like that. And it's every player is different. Like, you know what I mean? And then you look at somebody like Steph. Okay. Like last year they were talking about how his body changed, but Steph is probably the best shooter we've ever seen in life. Like he's a skilled player. It doesn't matter if he's a step slower, he's still going to shoot that joint from half court. So I think that um, somebody like a De'Aaron Fox, man, um, I, I think, as you said, like his speed is his skill. And he has to stay at a at a weight where you know he can move you know at yeah. a at a faster pace because if you take his speed away, now he's becoming an average NBA player. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. I think that Maybe. that hurts. Jordan Jordan and Kobe too put on weight when their game slowed down. Exactly. Yeah, just like Steph is doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when your game slows down, okay, put up put on the weight. You might have to you know. You know, you're playing more in the half court. You're not moving at the same speed as before. You might have to withstand some more contact. That's a different story. But De'Aaron Fox is, what, 25, 20? Yeah, he's young, yeah. Maybe, I mean, yeah, they say, like, I feel like get stronger, yeah, but it's different. I don't think you got to, like, necessarily put on 20 pounds to get stronger. And maybe they saying maybe he do need to get stronger, but putting on – putting a lot, 20 pounds on a, on a speedy guard is just asking for – him that, and injuries. I think. I think you like. You know, my. I feel like when I put on weight, my knees start hurting a little more, and you know, ankles start hurting a little more. You know what I'm saying? So it just, you know, it depends your frame too. I don't think his frame is is needs to be 200 pounds. Strength, strength for me is from the core down. You know, like it's core down yeah. and you and you good. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, nah, that's uh. Yeah, I mean, 30 points – I mean, 30 pounds, you know, from the time you enter into the league, that, that's crazy, yo. Yes. 30-pound difference, that's that's tough. That's why we played so fucking slow at Wisconsin, baby, because we used to be lifting all them damn football player weights and it couldn't move. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bro, it couldn't yeah, move. I was trying to condition it, and it's, it's very uh, crazy. Look – I, done, I had eight surgeries in 10 years from my junior year on, and I, I truly believe part of it has to do with the way we was lifting, like, and just putting all – because I probably mm – -hmm. I mean, I was always, you know, strong, but, like, I was probably 180 and probably, like, 195 – going in 180 and 195 by the, going into my sophomore year. Like, there's a picture in the restaurant in Madison right now, and I go in, they're still up. And boy, I look like 
low key I look fat, but it's really just all the the muscle milk yeah. I was drinking and all the, all the bench muscle presses. Milk. Actually, <laughs> yeah, they, 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 uh, when I went to school, they made me put a lot of weight on too. Like I feel like I gained probably ten pounds from my freshman and sophomore year. Mm-hmm. I definitely didn't. I mean, you know, that's what they wanted. So and you look stronger, and you know what I'm saying. And mm-hmm. strength coaches, yep, you know what I'm saying. He's strong, so he wants you to be bigger and bulkier. But I, I don't think that was like, I don't think that was my, that was what I was supposed to be doing. I'm not gonna lie. I don't think no, but okay, unless you, if you a five man, okay, Un- I think yeah, sure. under undersized, undersized five men. I think yeah, are the man. ones like okay, mm-hmm. go ahead, go ahead and put on the weight because y'all, you know, y'all motherfuckers got to be. Doing whatever it is y'all doing, being extra fouling people and pushing people or whatever it is. Yeah, exactly. Doing. So cool for them, but yeah, other than that, nah. Yeah, it ain't it ain't the business. But uh, we got a paycheck, rain check. Somebody's paycheck is taking a rain check. Today's focus is uh Christian Coloco and Caleb Martin. They got into a little scuffle last night and got ejected from the game. Looks like they're they're both likely to get fined, but uh. Yeah, the conversation surrounding this incident is uh, how important is it to establish an identity around the league? And is it more important for guards or bigs to kind of establish that tough mentality? And not tough in regards to trying to fight guys, but just more so just like earning that that kind of like respect, like I'm not one to be messed with. Is it is it more important for guards or, or bigs to kind of establish that identity? Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's so much like, it's so much fakeness. It's fake fakeness. I don't know if that's a word, but it's so much like, uh, that's just a lot of fake shit that goes into all that fake scuffle and all that. That shit is not real, like at all. And being tough, I mean, who, who like, I guess Draymond's looked at as tough now. And uh, who else? There's not really many people. I, I think every, I think it, the, the league is like a, I think you get more out of being a nice guy than a tough guy, to be honest. Still, mm-hmm. still, Udonis has them. <laughs> Udonis has them, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, yeah, he coached down here. <laughs> man, I think th- this era of the league is the product of a bunch of rich NBA players having kids in the league, man. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> like, what I'm saying. And I'm, and I'm a suburb kid, like, you know, all these kids, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. All these kids that grew, up, that grew up in the suburbs, man. But I do feel like maybe not as a tough player, but I feel like it's extremely important to to find some type of identity in the league now because it's of like course, of course. when we when we were growing up, I remember it, like it paid off just to be you had to have all this, especially as a guard. Like you know, you had to be able to do everything. You had to be able to defend. Yeah, of course. You had to be able to hit shots, make plays, whatever. And now it's like it's almost better to be able to do only one thing, which is kind of which is yeah. kind of crazy to me. Like. Like yeah, people really, sure. people really take pride in like, well, I ain't paid to do that. Like I'm paid, I'm paid to shoot mm-hmm. the ball. I ain't paid to play defense. Like, like yeah. damn. Like, I wish, I is, wish I knew more of that. Like when I was coming out, yeah. like when I was, you know, I was coming up, I was just raised like, you know, do everything to win. Try to, but if I wish I knew a little more, like about like, oh yeah, do this. This how you, this how you get paid. This is, you know, what I'm saying, this is what you, you know, what I'm saying, this is what they like to see right here. I wish I, I, I wish I had a little more knowledge about that when I was coming, like coming out of college and going into college and really, to be honest, yeah, that would help me a lot. We we've talked about on this show before how much of a benefit it is to have, you know, a dad or an uncle or whatever who is a professional athlete, specifically yeah, a professional yeah. basketball player and and an NBA player for real. The, the learning curve and I overseas as well, but I think it, it really just, it really kills that learning curve and gives you an advantage just on how to course, move and, you know, the steps how to, work you take, how to work, how to, you know, yeah. when not to work. Cause you know, back in the day it was, you know, getting the gym and being that, being that motherfucker all day. Like, nah, man, yeah. like you just in there just running around, like doing the mic and drill or whatever it is you're right. doing, taking 30 pull-ups, threes for, for trying to make a thousand. Ain't nobody even, all right, if you can make yeah. a thousand shots, great. But how realistic is that in the you know an hour yeah, and a half, yeah, like yeah. resting your body and icing and all that stretching? So yeah, I ain't I ain't do none of that. Growing none up. of it. No, no. <laughs> I would. My my dad was you know best dad ever. You know, but he didn't. You know, he wasn't no athlete. Like mm-hmm. my dad was in the military and like mm-hmm. so. After I came from practice, I was you know we you know got McDonald's and went home and I whatever he told me to do, I would you know what I'm saying it wasn't no like. I wasn't – I was just trying to be the best. Like, he was trying to make me, like, the best 
you know, overall person instead of, you know, he didn't know how to make a like a professional athlete because he didn't, you know, he was just doing the best he could. And I I could see the difference between like kids who did have professional they taking care of their bodies when they fifteen. Like they know how to, you know what I'm saying? Like they stretching after they work. I ain't never seen nobody stretch after working out until I was in college, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. You know what I'm saying? Stuff like stuff like that was just I feel like I'm, you know, I I learned and and now I can help my kids with it. Uh, so yeah, that's that's something that you know you just got to learn. You know, generations get better and better as you go on. Facts, facts. Mm-hmm. Hey man, we gonna we gonna finish up last one we got. You know, since you have been a duo, your whole part of a duo, your whole life, man, is for everybody. We gonna talk about who's the best duo in the NBA right now before we sign off. <sighs> best duo right now. Um, oh man, best duo. You gotta go with uh, I, I'm not gonna lie, I watch the playoffs, but I don't really. I will say, um, Jason Tatum and uh, Jalen Brown right now. I mean, you can't really, you can't really go against they was in the finals last year. Uh, obviously, they lost to the probably the best one of the best teams ever put together, like, overall. But, yeah, I mean, them them two young dudes are – they figuring it out. They really play the same position, and they figuring it out, and they winning. <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I have to go with them. They, I have to go with them, for sure. But you got good. Yeah, that's who I was thinking off the top of my head because I feel like they, they just both present so many problems. I think they compete on both ends. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they both You know what I mean? Too. I think they – yeah, I think they're they're a tough, tough duo, and it, and it's rare that you see that. You know, let's just say on the <laughs> quote unquote wing, you know, wing sides of the ball. You know what I'm saying? I think that you know the Clippers kind of got like a similar makeup, you know, with PG and Kawhi and whatnot. Oh, yeah. But um, about them. but them niggas can't stay healthy. But yeah, I think sure. that uh, yeah, nah, Boston. I think yeah, with Jalen and uh Jason, I think they're a tough duo right now. Yeah, Over sure. Kyrie, Kyrie and KD too. They ain't been together, me. man. They always, you know. You gotta show me something to be honest. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Kyrie and KD gotta show you something. Together, I mean, they they lost. Like you know what I'm saying? They they lost. Did they lose in the first round? They got swept last year. I'm by, not, yeah, I'm by not. the Celtics. <laughs> but like individually, <laughs> individually, best player, I would go them too. But I'm saying together, together. winning, like yeah, I was, yeah. If, I gotta if, see if together, I'm going uh, Giannis and Chris Middleton. I think the way they complement each other is Gian, Giannis. Yeah. Listen, I, I I I had to come with grip. I had to come to grips with this. Giannis too, is the best too. player in the yeah. NBA, dog. Like, and I really at this point in time, right now today, I really don't think it's that close. Yeah, me too. I had <laughs> like, to come with it. <laughs> it's like and I, I really, I really fought this. I like Giannis's game. He plays so hard, man. Like honestly, if I had a kid, I'm saying like as far as the way someone plays, like you gotta watch Giannis. Like he's old school. Dude Giannis. plays hard every night. He's in. Like it's it's really crazy. But the way him and Chris Middleton uh, complement each other, um, kind of you know, Chris Middleton's there for late game shots, and Giannis dominates the not Giannis dominates the whole game. I think they just have a just have a, a great. Uh, <clears throat> A great uh, rapport with each other, and Giannis is the best player in the NBA by far. I think so. I, I got to go with yeah. him as the duo. I think so. I was fighting that for a long time too, but he is though. <laughs> he had forty four and twenty eight for twenty eight minutes last night. Like, bro, what? Yeah, nah. You, he's tough. I, I think. I think too though. Like, you know, it's funny, man, because I mean, his brother being on his team, his brother. Like, if you watch, like Giannis, and I was That's, watching Giannis when they were playing with Greece. His brother is like legit, like his hype man. Like yeah. I'm talking about the entire game. He's in his ear. He's yelling him. He's keeping that energy high and whatnot. And I really believe, like that's why he's there, bro. He's there Boy, to kind of keep cool. the un- keep see, the engine running. You know what I mean? You see, he picked yeah. his nose the other day for him. <laughs> no, I know. He's like it's like it's like a corner man, like for a boxer. Like you got Mike no, Tyson bro. out there. Nah, it's that's like, that's, that's the that's, that's the worst role. duo in the NBA. Nah, that's that's the worst duo in the NBA. Oh, of course, one of the worst, the worst, worst, worst duo, worst duo in the league, man. Hey, how how how? Uh, last question. How how um how dope is that to have a twin, man? That like when you get to play together, like y'all just be yeah. feeding off of each other. 
like the, and pushing each other. How how dope is that? To, yeah, to play of with course. Your I mean, you just gotta imagine like just playing with somebody your whole life and just knowing like, okay, this is what he'd like to do. This is what he about to do. Uh, you know, I can't even explain it because I don't know. I don't know anything else. You know. But uh, playing playing with him is way better than playing without him for sure. It's been a long time since so I got a chance. We play we play together in the summer, uh, like you know, little little uh, pro ams and shit in Houston. But play, I, I definitely miss playing with him. That's that's that was one of the reasons that I probably fell in love with basketball so much, just being able to play with my brother and shit like that. And I haven't really been able to play with him professionally, but maybe I mean, hopefully we'll get to do that before we finish playing. That'd be pretty cool. That ESP gonna, shit is real, huh? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. You, you and uh, you and your brother gonna take that twenty five hundred in Mexico to play together? Never, <laughs> never, never. If I'm taking twenty five hundred. I'm not playing no basketball. <laughs> I'm gonna figure it out, but I ain't playing no basketball. Though. <laughs> hey man we appreciate you joining us man that was love had a lot of fun with you hopefully you come back and join us again for the role player podcast i'm jordan taylor anthony goods and that's aaron harrison we'll catch y'all next time appreciate y'all